Welcome to the HerbWorks Podcast featuring Roger Drummer, the formulator at HerbWorks.com. An educator in the field of nutrition and Chinese herbalism, Roger has a unique ability to keep things simple by taking all the guesswork out of complicated health issues. HerbWorks is committed to helping you improve your health and enhance your life through herbs and common sense. Roger Drummer here with another HerbWorks podcast. And what are we talking about today? Well, I think I'm going to title this one, Casting Doubts on the Keto Diet. Basically, I'm going to go over some studies that were just published um, showing that they think that the keto diet may not be as healthy for people as you would think. And I also want to give a big thank you to one of our listeners for sending me the links to these studies because uh, I actually love that. So if anybody's out there listening to my podcast and they see anything on topics that I cover, I would love it if you sent it to me. It may be the uh, next podcast that I do. So this one is based on an article entitled Three huge studies of more than half a million people are casting doubts on the keto diet. So I'm going to go into that a little bit in depth, give you my opinion on it, and my opinion on food and the ketogenic diet, my opinion on using the ketogenic diet. Now, I will tell you up front, I am not a scientist. I use my body as my own little laboratory. And I am an expert on ketogenic diets only in one regard. And that is that I've been on one now for over two years. And I'm I'm in medical ketosis most of the time. And I've used this diet to get rid of stage 3 cancer in less than two months. So that does not make me a scientist. But it makes me, how would you put it, a layman's scientist. A lay scientist. Let's put it that way. Okay. I'm just a guy with a lot of experience using the ketogenic diet. I also have a very broad mind of of how to read things and and figure out what they're actually saying in these studies. So I'm going to share that all with you today and talk a little bit about food and my opinion on the ketogenic diet, all those different things. So Anyway, this was based on three different studies, and it was true. It totaled about a half a million people that they did studies with. Here's the problem with all of these things and the problem with most studies. These were all self-reported studies. In other words, people wrote in and filled out questionnaires saying what they've eaten in the last 5, 10, 20 years. Okay? I don't know anybody that remembers what they ate two days ago, let alone what they eat every single day of the year. I also know, and I'm basing this on personal experience with having sat down and done consultations with over 40,000 people, and that is that people never tell you the full truth. You never really get the full diet from someone that they're eating, so you have to take it with a grain of salt look at what their health issues are and go from that standpoint when you figure out programs because not everybody's going to tell you exactly what they eat. They know that you're into health, so they're not going to tell you about the worst things they eat. They're going to tell you that they eat more of the good things that they think are good for them. And this is what the problem is with all these studies. The only thing that this study is actually good for is to give you information so that you can do a real study. That's what these studies are supposed to be for. They're supposed to be to give you correlations, ideas, and there's great correlations in this information, by the way. And, and this, is, this is one of the things about all studies like this that are published. Oftentimes, they have really good information in them mixed in with just assumptions, and which could lead to changing entire protocols for medicine or health based on an assumption of what you think was going on with the information when it was really just correlation. So, basically, that's the problem. But, 
Again, a lot of great information. And basically what they said in this study was that being really strict to your carbohydrates or eating too many carbohydrates shortens your life. And that a moderate amount, something right in the middle, is the type of carbohydrate consumption that you should have that increases your longevity. Now, I probably agree with that. But the problem, again, with this study is that it's just assuming that people are reporting what they actually eat. And it nowhere really got into quality of the carbohydrates you're eating, which it makes all the difference in the world. And then it kind of used this because it did mention that if it's below 50%, it has an, a negative effect on your mortality. And so that gave them the idea that the uh, low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet is not beneficial for you. Now, here's my take on that, just so you know. I honestly think that there's probably a lot of people attempting the ketogenic diet that it isn't actually great for them. And they don't need to be that strict with their food. What they need to do is get the junk out of their diet and see how they feel and see what their health is really like in the absence of all the junk that they put in their body. And by that, I mean... You know, all the white bread and the flours and the, and the foods that have absolutely no nutritional value. You know, your french fries, your potato chips, your taco chips, your, your white bread, all these different things, and the sugar. You know, if you look, lump all those things together, um, in America, almost 60% of the calorie intake for the average individual comes from sugar. It probably is higher than that when you realize a lot of those things I just mentioned turn into sugar. And so if you could clean that up and replace it with real food, wow, you've just made a quantum leap in your diet, a quantum leap in any health condition. Now, if you need to take that a step further, there's a ketogenic diet. There's also the paleo diet, but, you know, which... I always laugh when I read about the paleo diet. It seems like, boy, that is the diet they've been bashing for the last year. And the reality is, is that, you know what? There's more great science on food came out when they started writing about the paleo diet than anything that I've read in the health industry in the last 20 some years. The people that are, are really into that diet and are heavily into research and food and real food and you know like one of the one of the, one of the people that was bashing it said well i researched it and in the paleolithic period they didn't eat those exact foods and i'm thinking you know i've never actually even looked to see when that period occurred in history when i hear paleo i'm just thinking of ancient diet back before processed food. I don't care if the food was around 200,000 years ago, a million years ago, whatever. Is it processed? Is it real? Does it have a beneficial effect on your body? To me, paleo just means natural food, okay? Unprocessed natural food. But the reality is, is that today we're going to focus on the ketogenic diet, which isn't that far off of paleo. It's just a refinement of it. You have to realize almost every diet in the world is a refinement of another diet. But the ketogenic diet limits your carbs to about 30 grams a day. And then, so basically it's limiting or eliminating all sugar. And funny thing in this article, they mentioned that they, they don't want you to eat sugar. It's like they're almost alluding to the fact that there's a um, really healthy level of sugar in your diet. And the reality is there, there probably isn't. You know, if you're consuming sugary things more than once or twice a week, you got a problem. That's just a reality. And so, in this study, they found that 50% of your calories come from carbs. That seems to be ideal. Okay, well, the ketogenic diet is 30 grams. That's really small. 30 grams of carbs is about 120 calories. And 120 calories in a typical diet, let's say if you're a man, you're probably going to consume 2,500 calories in a day. 120 is not many calories from carbs. All right, so that means you're really kind of on the low end of the scale. But you have to remember with the ketogenic diet, 
is that it's often best used as a transitional diet or as a therapeutic diet. Now, in my case, it was therapeutic. I had cancer. I wanted. I actually ate a really good diet. If you looked at my diet before I found out I had cancer, you would think that's a really good diet to go on in case you get cancer. Or if you get cancer, go on that diet. It'll go away. Well, I was eating that diet, and I ended up with cancer. Of course, my cancer might have been, you know, percolating for a good 30 to 40 years, according to my doctor. It's a slow-growing thing. So... Anyway, so I had to switch. I just did a complete flip and went into ketosis, medical ketosis, and under two months, I was found out I was cancer-free. So it was a great thing for me. But that's a therapeutic diet. I had an idea in mind of what I wanted to do, which was change my metabolism from burning carbs or sugar to my metabolism now just burning ketones or fats. And the idea and why it's therapeutic was because by switching my metabolism, I cut off the only energy source that a cancer cell has, and that's um, surviving on fermented sugar. So because it was being denied its number one calorie source, um, taking all the herbs that I took and the meditation and the frame of mind that I was in, it basically just went away. I created an environment where cancer just didn't like being around, and it left. And so for me, that was a very therapeutic diet. It could be a transitional diet, too, because you could go through what I, what I went through, and then you could lighten up to where you go from medical ketosis to nutritional ketosis. Now, in case you're wondering what the difference in that is, it has to do with levels of blood sugar and levels of ketones. This podcast is brought to you by Herbworks, specializing in stress and brain essentials. Check out Roger's other articles and videos at Herbworks.com. While you're there, take a look at our natural herbal-based product line for energy, stress, immunity, and sleep. Now back to Roger. Ideally, in medical ketosis, you want to have your ketone level up around 4 and your blood sugar at 72 or below. And why do I pick those numbers out? Because they're the easiest to do the math. If your blood sugar is below 72 and your ketones are over 4, then you have a what's called a glucose ketone index of 1. And by doing that math, that basically says you're in full-on medical ketosis and your cancer is being starved or sufficiently um, harmed by your diet. It's just not getting anything to eat. So that's what you shoot for. Now, you know, nutritional ketosis is a different thing. Nutritional ketosis, you kind of want to shoot for blood sugar between 80 and 90, which is really good blood sugar. And you want to have your ketones anywhere from 0.5 to about 2. And that's really not hard to do. Basically, that's just a low-carb diet. And a low-carb diet does, that, does not mean that you have to eat less than 30 grams of carbs a day. I, you know, this is just my opinion, and, and you have to test your own blood to figure this out yourself. But I honestly don't think that you have to limit your carbs on a ketogenic diet as long as those carbs are only coming from vegetables. And a large portion of those are what they call low glycemic, or they have a low glycemic load. And, you know, there's tons of those. Literally, you make a list, put it on your fridge, and all of a sudden, you're just eating those, and you you forget about it. I have never counted my carbs. Now, think about that. I went through medical ketosis. I had cancer. I got rid of it. I never counted my carbs. The only carbs I counted was I would look at my packages of raw nuts once in a while and see what the carb content was. And then I never measured them. I always was overeating them. Uh, I have a tendency to overeat. But I was eating a lot of them. But you know what? In my opinion, getting four carbs from some nuts, it's also giving me 20 grams of fat and maybe two grams of protein isn't going to mess up my ketosis. There's so much fat in there, right? And so 
I didn't worry about it. I didn't count my carbs from vegetables. I didn't weigh my vegetables. I ate all the vegetables I wanted. And I probably, I would have to guess I was eating 8 to 10, maybe 12 servings of vegetables a day. And that's a lot of more carb than 30 grams. And yet, I was in medical ketosis. I honestly think your body can can run on that without worrying a whole lot about it. Now, think about this. Do you think you could eat a pound of broccoli? A pound of broccoli is a lot of broccoli, right? A pound of broccoli has 154 calories in it. Think about that. 154 calories in a pound of broccoli. So basically, um, you could eat broccoli all day long. You could, you could eat two pounds of broccoli. <laughs> so... In my opinion, without looking it up, I would imagine that kale and chard and collard greens and probably maybe cauliflower and cabbage, a lot of those things fall into about the exact same calorie count. There's not that much difference in them. So you could almost eat two pounds of vegetables, which is about, wow, how many servings is that? Three... Two pounds of vegetables is at least 10 servings, 10 to 12 servings of stuff, and only have 300 calories. It's amazing how much space that takes up in your digestive system. And so this is why I don't think you have to limit your amount of vegetables that you eat and why you have to be so strict counting your carbs. Now, I didn't eat fruit because fruit has sugar and it spikes your sugar too much. And my goal, because I was a therapeutic diet, my goal was to regulate my sugar. I didn't care about the nutrition. You're going to laugh about this, but when I started it, I told myself that I no longer cared about the nutritional content or the the amount of nutrition in my diet. You know, that being said, I also only ate organic, and I was eating vegetables all the time. So I didn't have to care about it. The main thrust of my diet was regulating my blood sugar, getting into ketosis. And so that's what I did. Ate vegetables all day long. Every meal I had a, just a plate full of vegetables. And if, I, if that plate full of food didn't satisfy me, I ate another however much vegetable I wanted. But I did limit my protein. I limited my protein as far as protein foods. Now, here's the difference. I limited my protein foods. In other words, when I started on the diet, I only ate eggs. I was eating fish maybe once, twice a month. But when I started on the diet, I actually was just eating eggs. I'd have eggs for breakfast, three or four. And then in the evening, you know, I really didn't have any protein other than what was coming from nuts and different things like that. And so I eat mostly vegetables after that. Nuts, vegetables. I had this, at the time I was doing the budwig thing where you mix the yogurt with, or cottage cheese with some flaxseed, but even that was not more than 8 or 10 grams of protein. So my protein foods was not that much. About 30 days into it, I started getting a little tired and I added fish to my diet and I had fish every day. Normally that was sardines and I never liked sardines. And then all of a sudden, my wife always had them around, and I tried some, and they were actually pretty good. And I was able to eat a can of sardines, um, you know, and then, you know, every, twice a week I'd have some white fish or some salmon, something else. I didn't eat sardines every day, but my main food, my go-to thing was sardines, which just happens to be the healthiest fish that you can possibly eat. And the reason for that is that they're so small, they don't eat other fish, so they don't accumulate mercury. And they have a high omega-3 content. The funny thing about sardines is that the can has the exact amount of protein that I wanted to eat in a meal if I was eating a protein food, which was 25 grams. And so that would be my protein for the day. And I didn't waver off that. Now, I did get some protein out of vegetables. There is some in vegetables. I did get some protein from nuts because I ate three or four ounces of nuts. But, but I don't consider those protein foods because the main um, source of calories in it is not protein. So I probably then, I know that I, 
I averaged around 60 to 70 grams of protein max a day, right? Which is not a lot. I'm six foot two and weighed about 170 pounds when I started it all. So, you know, it's not a lot of protein. It's not excessive, but that satisfied me. And uh, the rest I ate was just vegetables. I never ate fruit, had too much sugar. And basically, I stuck to that diet, and it, it did me well. But back to this kind of study, and this is the, the problem I find with most people that write about the ketogenic diet, and most people that are going on it get so strict about their diet that I think the stress of it all is more harmful to them than having a few more carbs. You know, the idea that someone told me they couldn't drink my tea on chi because it had... 30 calories in it or something, mostly from carb. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> 30 calories <laughs> from carb. How much are you eating in a day? You know, uh, anyway, you get so strict. The stress of it all ruins your ketosis. And believe me, it, this, is, this is a fact. Stress can ruin your ketosis more than eating a few carbs. And why is that? Because when you're stressed out, you have a stress response. When you have a stress response, your own body floods itself with sugar to fuel your muscles and to fuel your brain for fight or flight. But all you're doing is sitting around wondering about whether you should eat something else or you got an email or you're stuck in traffic. It's just all stress. It's a stress response. If you're continuously stressed, you can't control your blood sugar. This is why, you know, I lucked out because, you know, I make things for stress. And so I lucked out when I got cancer that I realized one day that I had the perfect things here for my stress. And believe me, there's nothing more stressful than finding out you have cancer. And I started taking my inner peace, and that became my go-to supplement every day. I took inner peace a couple times a day. It not only helped me with resetting my brain and dealing with my stress, it helped me with my blood sugar. By not being completely panicked and not being upset and totally stressed out every single moment thinking about survival, I actually was able to regulate my blood sugar. It made it easier. And so, but again, you know, that's the therapeutic diet. Getting into um, nutritional ketosis is more just like a standard low-carb diet. You know, I don't think that would be hard for anybody to get into. And, you know, and Dr. Hyman's been talking about this for years, the low-carb approach to everything, regulating your blood sugar. And that's true. Regulating your blood sugar will have an immediate impact on every chronic disease known to man. And so that's within the, within the reach of anybody that wants to do it. And you can do that on this diet that they're talking about, which is 50% of your calories from carbs. Now, if you get into that article and you look at the pictures from it, you'll see that they're talking about carbs like quinoa, beans. You know, it's always in the picture, right? And, you know, those are good carbs if you're not trying to get into therapeutic ketosis. But it's a great low-carb diet. You still don't eat those excessively, but I've never seen a picture when someone's talking about a low-carb diet or a healthy carbohydrate diet that had a bunch of loaves of bread and white flour and white rolls and, and things like that. It just doesn't exist. Or sugary drinks or fruit juice or all those things. Those are not healthy carbs, right? So I can imagine if you have a balanced brain, let's say you've been you know, paying attention to your health and your brain and and you um, have been eating well and you've regulated your blood sugar, that you can probably even eat 50% of your calories from carbs and be in some sort of nutritional ketosis. It doesn't take that much. Nutritional ketosis basically is just 0.5 on the ketone meter, which is nothing. And so... Uh, it's, you know, it's not hard to do. So you have to realize with all these studies that it's vague general information. And again, their, their information is pretty right on. If you have a 50% of your calories from carbs and the worst carb that you're eating is quinoa or beans, you're on a healthy diet. It just not might not be the therapeutic type of diet you need to either lose your weight or to get to the point where you feel really good. 
So this is this is the point here. Maybe this diet is the diet that you should be on six months after you go on to a more radical diet, where you really limit all your carbs, you get rid of grains, you do all these things to clean up, and you reset your metabolism, and then you start introducing things back into it. That may be... Here's the thing about ketosis. I was lucky enough that when I decided to do it, one, I had a friend who had done it and told me about it, helped me out. Two... I'm in the health field. I've been in the health field since 1981, and the concept was not foreign to me. And I know a lot about health. I know how to research health. I know how to find information. I know how to read information and separate the reality from the just marketing hype. And that helped me a lot. I always tell people this. In less than two days, I was in medical ketosis. It was just boom. It was right there. And why was that? Because for a year or two before that, I had already adopted a, a low-carb, fat-based diet. Because I'm a fan of Dr. Hyman's. Got great information. Great guy. And, you know, I've read his books. I've watched some of it, listened to some of his podcasts. And the reality is, is that he has some great information. And, and I honestly believe that regulating your blood sugar is the key to longevity and health and the key to avoiding chronic illness. And so I was on that diet. Now, on that diet, I did not um, limit my carbohydrate consumption, although I did not eat bread. Um, I did eat quinoa. And, but I ate very little grains in general, and I was on a gluten-free diet for, I've been on one now for over nine years. And so, you know, I was a pretty healthy diet. I ate a lot of avocados, coconut oil, nuts, that type of thing. And here's one of the things you have to realize with these diets, too, which they don't cover a lot. They don't cover it at all in this article or on the studies, is that there are variances to everything. If you're not someone like me, you need to either have a friend who's done it or you consult an expert, buy a few books, get some information, maybe even hire a nutritionist to help you out. You can't just decide to do something one day. And this is the, this is the mistake a lot of people do. They just decide to do it one day without reading anything except for an article or two, never get a book, never research it, never really figure out what exactly that is, and they jump into it. And then on the side, they're still consuming some soda pops and eating potato chips and doing some things, but they're trying to be ketogenic. It just doesn't work. You know, this low-carb diet and high fat is just as bad for you if it's junk food as having a high-carb and low-fat diet. There's no difference in it. Both of them contain incredible amounts of inflammatory chemicals, and both of them will kill you. You have to have some common sense and eat real food. Now, here's, here's what's going on in your body when you're consuming one of those two diets, right? Let's say you eat a lot of carbs. You're drinking a lot of sugary drinks, and you're on a low-fat diet. More than likely, if you're on that diet, you're probably also consuming what little fat you do consume from mostly hydrogenated oils because that's what the government and all these so-called health experts told you to do for years. So you're eating margarine, you're buying normal cooking oils, canola oils, all this crap, and you're using that in your food, which is probably two of the most inflammatory ingredients in your food you could ever eat. And then you're consuming a high carbohydrate, high sugar, because most of your carbohydrates are coming from bread, coming from pasta, coming from potato chips and other foods that have toxic fats in it. And so your body is basically losing its ability to regulate your sugar, which causes incredible amounts of inflammation. And then the fats you do have are toxic, which create instant inflammation all over your body. So you're inflamed, you're unhealthy, and you're probably moving toward gaining a bunch of weight and getting diabetes. Now you flip that switch to something else, and you go, I'm just going to eat more fat. Well, if you eat more fat, you have to limit your carbohydrates, especially limiting them to vegetables, because if you don't, now your now your body's got besides having too much sugar floating around in your system, you got too much fat floating around. And you know what? Your body only knows how to do one at, one or the other at a time. If your sugar's high, you can't process the fat you ate. Right? So you have to choose one or the other. You can't just 
decide I'm going to eat a high fat diet and think that French fries is your high fat food now. And it goes along with your carbs, your high carbs and sugar. It just doesn't work. You have to do one or the other. But again, I'm one of those people that doesn't think that, you know, limiting your carbs has anything to do with your vegetable intake. But that's just me. So you have to be careful about the quality of your food. And if you don't make the mistake of eating food that's low quality, then you really don't have that many worries. Again, unless you're on a therapeutic diet. And, I, and for most of the people out there, if you're just going into ketosis, medical ketosis, because you're worried about getting cancer, you're way over worried about things. <laughs> you shouldn't be on a therapeutic diet for cancer unless you have cancer. Um, but there's nothing wrong with going into ketosis. I think the diet's wonderful, but, I, but it's not much different than a low-carb, quality-fat diet, right? And they also bring up the the idea of meat. They always have this idea that everybody on ketosis or everybody in ketosis or the paleo diet are just sitting around, you know, consuming meat by the pound, by the tonnage per year. And that's what they live on. You always see these pictures with the articles where they have a huge piece of meat, a bunch of avocados and a radish or something, <laughs> one slice of a tomato. <laughs> I always love those pictures. But the reality is you consume these things in limited quantity, depending on your body weight, depending on your your requirements for protein, and you don't overdo it. There's actually healthy benefits from consuming some animal products, and a lot of people thrive on that. But you don't have to overdo it. So the things that are really healthy for you to eat when you're on a ketogenic diet is, well, you can have meat if you like it, fish, greens, eggs, oil, as long as it's, you know, coconut oil or really good quality olive oil, avocados, raw nuts, make sure your nuts are raw. You cannot be consuming nuts if they're roasted all the time because that means they've cooked the oil. Cooked oil is rancid oil. It causes inflammation. The whole reason you're eating this diet, one of them, is to lower your inflammation. Inflammation drives cancer cell replication. It drives the production of excessive cholesterol. It drives the production or the destruction, I should say, of neurons in your brain. So stop. Um, Don't consume too many omega-6 oils. And by that, what I mean is you don't want to be consuming soy oil, corn oil, Um, sunflower oil, safflower oil, canola, all these oils that you cook with, you want to eliminate. Now, there's a difference in some of it. Some of it can be high oleic oil, and if you have to use a little oil, then you can use that because a high oleic oil is the same as olive oil. It has a different balance of fats in it. But as far as seeds go, because seeds, things like sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds. They're very high in omega-6 oils, but you have to realize those are raw. Those are raw oils. They have a great benefit to your health. They're anti-inflammatory, and they're highly nutritious. You can have those. You just don't want to eat the cooked, processed oils that are omega-6. You can have cauliflower. You can have, you know, all kinds of drinks. You can have, you know, Water, coffee, tea. You know, the big thing with a lot of these articles, they talk about heavy cream, you know, whipping cream, like we're all sitting around drinking quarts of whipping cream every day. The reality is what I found in my own ketosis, medical ketosis, was that I had to severely limit my dairy products. I wasn't a milk drinker anyway. Cream kind of pushed me over the top. And uh, I did limit my cheese, but I have to admit, every once in a while, I just like a piece of cheese, but I don't eat dishes that are filled with cheese, so I have a really good piece of cheese once in a while, and I love it. It doesn't do that much to me or throw me off. Some people can tolerate cheese, eating it every single day and stay in ketosis. I'm not one of those people. I'm also someone who found, through my own experimentation, that if I go over my requirement for calories in a day... So if I'm over-consumed, which is easy to do with cream, right? I mean, who doesn't like to eat cream? 
So, <laughs> or <laughs> cream, creamed anything, right? So, if I'm consuming too many things like that, then I tend to go over my allowed amount of calories per day, and it affects my blood sugar, and it affects my ketosis, even though it was healthy, ketogenic food. That's just me, and uh, but that might be true for a lot of people. So, you have to watch that. But the reality is, is that on this diet, I am eating an incredible amount of nutrition. And this is one of the other things they pointed out in this study is that people become nutritionally deficient on these diets. Well, I hate to tell you, but I would venture to guess without a scientific study, but I have read numerous studies on this in the last decade, and it pretty much points to the same conclusion. And that is probably 80% of the country is severely deficient in a lot of nutrients. We're talking about B vitamins, certain forms of it, magnesium, minerals, vitamin E, um, you name it. We're a country that's really deficient in nutrients. We, that old saying, uh, Overfed and undernourished, that's America, believe me. So to point out that you could become nutritionally deficient on the ketogenic diet is not looking at the fact that you're probably starting out severely nutritionally deficient. And so you, if you're worried about that, you should get tested and find out exactly where you're at and find out what nutrients you need to supplement your diet. So here's the basics, though. If you want to be healthy... Here's the basics of ketosis, nutritional ketosis, right? You can have some fruit with nutritional ketosis, but limit it to berries. If you want to eat some more fruit than that, do it once a day or once, I'm I'm sorry, once a week. It'd probably be better for you. Just enjoy yourself once a week. Carbs, get rid of the bread, the pasta, the rice, the potatoes. And again, you know, you can always have those once a week if you're having a high carb day. A lot of people do that now where they cycle in and out of medical ketosis. I myself do it on on the days that I work out with weights. I add another few things into my diet that I typically wouldn't eat, like sweet potatoes and different things, and just give myself a little more carb. It never really affects my medical ketosis the next day. I get right back into it. Um, You don't want to have any sweeteners, really, sugar, corn syrup, anything in your diet. I wouldn't be consuming milk, but when it comes back to that old topic of carbs, really what you want to do is have carbs with fiber in it. This is why beans are kind of misleading. You can have beans a little bit, but you want to limit it, but beans have a lot of fiber. They also have a lot of sugar, so you just have to figure out where you're going to have them and if you're going to have them. And uh, as far as vegetables, they have this thing called net carb, which is basically saying that if you consume a dish of 10 grams of carbohydrate, it's all vegetable, and five of it's fiber, then you're really only consuming five. Now, with certain people, they'll argue about that. But again, it depends on your own body and how sensitive you are to things. Um, I tend to eat a lot of vegetable carb, which are all high in fiber anyway, and I, again, don't worry about it. Um, They even mentioned in this diet that it's extreme and it causes kidney stones. Well, you know, (laughs) I've never, never seen anything that they've ever claimed to cause kidney stones cause kidney stones. Let me tell you what causes kidney stones. It's lack of water causes kidney stones. They used to blame it on vitamin C, and now they're blaming the ketogenic diet. Here's the thing you have to worry about with kidney stones, ketogenic diet, and water. One, you don't want to be on an extreme high-protein diet with very low carb. You should not be consuming 150 to 200 grams of protein a day on an extreme diet that could be harmful to your kidneys because it's too much protein, right? Now, most people will never do that except extreme bodybuilders that tend to have this addiction to protein and how they're going to look in building muscle and all these different things. So, one, most people will never have to worry about that. 
Two, you have to drink water. You know, the average person at the minimum should be drinking a half gallon of water a day. Fresh water. Not stuff you buy in bottled plastic things from the grocery store. Clean, filtered water. Spring water, if you can find it. Just clean water, right? When you go on a ketogenic diet and you severely limit your carbohydrates, your body changes its metabolism and you require more water. Just the fact that you're not stimulating your insulin all the time changes how your body processes fluids and minerals, and it changes how much water your kidneys move. So you have to drink extra water. Ideally, you're going to drink three liters of water a day. You might think that's extreme, but it really helps you, and not only just with your kidneys and preventing kidney stones, which again are related to dehydration over a period of time, but... It also helps you make, make you feel just satisfied, and you'd be surprised how much less food you actually need. One of the things I learned doing this diet was that most of the time, people overeat. Not Even the people that are seem to be slim, um, we all eat way too much food. Way, way more food than we actually need. And if we change the nutritional quality of our food, we could actually eat less calories and feel better and not really lose weight. I know that sounds, sounds a little bit of an outrageous idea, but the reality is you'll have less cravings. You'll feel less deprived if your food has nutrition in it. And you're supplementing a little bit because your body's getting what it needs. Oftentimes, you have cravings for a couple different reasons. One, your brain doesn't have enough protein to to um, make dopamine, and thus so, and that puts a lid on your cravings. And two, you're just nutritionally deficient. Your body is driving you to eat something because it needs nutrition. So you have to satisfy those needs. One of the things I did after I had cancer after I got rid of it I did a whole bunch of blood tests and you would have thought I did that beforehand but I just didn't have the time and I you know I I was in a mode of thinking I was just going to starve my cancer and that was my main objective but I was also curious as to why I ended up with it and what was going on in my body and I did a series of blood tests found out I was extremely deficient in omega-3 fatty acids Now, that was fascinating to me because I was eating flax seeds every single day for three months before I did that test. And I'm talking about two to four ground up tablespoons of flaxseed powder every single day. And I was still extremely deficient in it. So basically, it reminded me that you just don't convert that to omega-3 active in your body too, too readily. And then the other thing I found out was that my liver was not making glutathione. So I was deficient in the process by which my own liver um, methylated certain vitamins and created glutathione to protect my DNA from toxic damage that could have prevented me from getting cancer. So my liver was just low in function on certain things, and so I changed my diet to compensate for that. And now I take something every day for that. I eat certain foods for that, and uh, hopefully it's corrected. I'm going to get tested here one of these days soon. But it was really helpful information to find that out, to not be shooting in the dark about everything that I do. So... I'm looking at my timer and realizing I have once again talked for way too long. And so I'm going to go over a few things here and uh, let you know with all studies that you read, they're basically studies that should cause you to investigate more deeply into the information that you're reading. Rarely does someone reporting for a newspaper or an online article go into heavy science, or even have any background into what they're reporting on. This is the one thing you really have to realize, is that most of these articles you read are just written by people who write articles for a living. 
They're not somebody who's a expert on ketosis or an expert on diets or an expert on health. They're basically just writing articles. And the next article they could be writing might be on bicycle tires, for all you know. So this study, again, had a lot of good information in it. And then it had information that you should be checking out somewhere else. And so... Anyway, that's my take on three huge studies of more than a half million people are casting doubts on the ketogenic diet. And I just want to say that with any diet, there's pros and cons, and there's always really great versions of a diet and really poor versions of the diet, depending on which one you decide to adapt into your own lifestyle. But you remember, the whole thing is about getting healthy. And the whole idea is basically uh, getting a healthier diet, having a healthier life, and being a little happier. And so this is Roger Drummer signing off on another HerbWorks podcast. Thanks for tuning in.